So today I'll be talking about Eliquis, also known as Apixaban. It's a factor 10 inhibitor, and it comes as a white to pale yellow powder. Eliquis tablets are available for oral administration in strengths of 2.5 milligrams and 5 milligrams of Apixaban. So let me go over um, let me go over vascular injury, the concept of vascular injury, before we move on and discuss the the medication a bit more. So following vascular injury, the body undergoes hemostasis, arrest of a bleed, um, and that's really essential to life. Within our vascular system, the blood remains in a fluid state, um, and that produces a steady state of blood volume, pressure, and flow. And the idea behind that is to really transport oxygen, nutrients, plasma, proteins, and waste. So if there is a vascular injury, like any damage or if there is a bleed, this involves a series of reactions involving a complex interplay of thrombogenic and antithrombotic stimuli. So you, you'll basically see a complex sequence of events, and those include formation of a platelet plug, um, activation of the coagulation cascade, formation of a blood clot, clot dissolution and uh, fibrinolysis. So since there is this disruption that has occurred to this delicate system of checks and balances, that may lead to inappropriate clot formation within the blood vessel and that therefore obstructs blood flow or embolizes to a distant vascular bed. So um, in, the, er, in the late 1800s, uh, Dr. Rudolf Virchow, who's um, a German pathologist, he recognized the role played by blood vessels and he recognized the three main factors that lead to pathologic clot formation. And those include endothelial injury. So for example, um, that can occur as a result of atherosclerosis, uh, which leads to platelet adhesion and aggregation. Abnormalities of blood flow. So if there is turbulent blood flow in the arteries and there is stasis, for example, of blood flow in the veins, that will promote thrombus formation. And finally, hypercoagulable states. And those three made up the Virchow's triad um, in regards to Dr. Rudolph's um, discovery. Normally, endothelial cells in blood vessels uh, maintain the blood flow by producing a number of substances that inhibit platelet adherence, activation, um, activation of the clotting cascade, and it facilitate fibrinolysis, like I mentioned. Vascular injury, though, results in exposure of the subendothelium. So the exposed subendothelium um, activates platelets. So the platelets are activated, and then they release substances that expose glycoprotein 2b, 3a receptors, receptor complex, into the circulation, and that causes platelets to adhere to one another. At the same time, the damaged vascular tissue releases tissue thromboplastin, or also known as tissue factor, and that activates the extrinsic pathway of the clotting cascade. When looking at the coagulation cascade or the clotting cascade, it is initiated through the intrinsic pathway as well as the extrinsic pathway. When looking at the intrinsic pathway, it's activated when Hageman factor, factor 12 in the plasma, contacts with subendothelial substances exposed by vascular injury. And the extrinsic pathway activated, it's generally activated when tissue thromboplastin or tissue, um, when tissue factor, a substance released by damaged endothelial cells, makes contact with one of the clotting factors. And that clotting factor ha happens to be clotting factor number seven which is also known as serum prothrombin conversion factor. Both lead to a final common pathway when each has activated factor 10, and this directly proceeds to clot formation. So let's look at it in a bit more detail. When you're looking at the intrinsic pathway, after the activation of factor 12, this leads to the activation of factor seven, which acts upon factor 11 and causes its activation to 11A, which acts upon factor 9 and forms factor 9A. And these reactions, as you can see, this, these conversions, they require calcium ions. Then the activated factor 9, which is 9A, in the presence of factor 8A 
and calcium ions. By the way, 8A is derived from factor 8 and combined with the calcium ions causes the activation of factor 10. And then really events are similar to the extrinsic pathway. So let's, let's look at the extrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway, as mentioned earlier, uh, the damaged endothelial cells, they release tissue factor, which is also known as tissue thromboplastin. And that leads to the activation of factor 7 to factor 7A. And tissue factor combines with the activated factor 7 in the presence of calcium ions and causes the conversion of factor 10 to 10A. Activated factor 10 in the presence of calcium ions and in the presence of factor 5 forms the prothrombin activator, which leads to the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. Really, both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways lead to prothrombin activator, which is factor 10. Once it is activated, again, how is it activated? It's activated in the presence of calcium ions and factor 5. And that converts prothrombin into thrombin, which leads to the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. And in the presence of factor 13, which is your fibrin stabilizing factor, and calcium ions, it converts them into a stabilized fibrin clot. Like I said, apixaban is a selective inhibitor of factor 10A. It does not require antithrombin 3 for antithrombotic activity. It does inhibit free and clot-bound factor 10A and prothrombinase activity. It, does, um, it has no direct effect on platelet aggregation, but indirectly it inhibits platelet aggregation induced by thrombin. By inhibiting factor 10A, apixaban decreases thrombin generation and thrombus development. As a result of factor 10A inhibition, apixaban prolongs the clotting tests such as prothrombin time, INR, and activated partial thromboplastin time. These changes of the clotting tests were very small and they were subject to a high degree of variability. So they're really not useful in monitoring the anticoagulation effect of, um, of apixaban. What was seen in pharmacodynamic drug interaction studies was that a 50% to 60% increase in anti-10A activity was observed when apixaban was co-administered with other medications such as enoxaparin or naproxen. The absolute bioavailability of apixaban is approximately 50% for doses up to 10 milligrams of Eliquis. Food does not affect the bioavailability of apixaban. Um, it is eliminated in both the urine and feces and it has an apparent half-life of approximately 12 hours following oral administration. Apixaban is indicated to reduce the risk of stroke and systemic embolism in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. It is indicated for the prophylaxis of deep vein thrombosis, which may lead to pulmonary embolism in patients who have undergone hip or knee replacement surgery. It's indicated for the treatment of DVT, deep vein thrombosis, it's indicated for the treatment of uh, pulmonary embolism, or PE. It is also indicated to reduce the risk of recurrent DVT and PE following initial therapy. When looking at dosage and administration, for the reduction of risk um, of stroke and systemic embolism in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation, the recommended dose of Eliquis for most patients is 5 milligrams taken orally twice daily. The recommended dose of Eliquis is 2.5 milligrams twice daily in patients with at least two of the following characteristics. Age greater than or equal to 80 years, body weight less than or equal to 60 kilograms, uh, serum creatinine greater than or equal to 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. Now for the prophylaxis of deep vein thrombosis following hip or knee replacement surgery, the recommended dose of Eliquis is 2.5 milligrams taken orally twice daily. The initial dose should be taken 12 to, 4 to 24 hours after surgery. In patients undergoing hip replacement surgery, the recommended duration of treatment is 35 days. In patients undergoing knee replacement surgery, the recommended duration of treatment is 12 days. 
Treatment of DVT and PE. The recommended dose of Eliquis in those patient population in that patient population is 10 mg taken orally twice daily for the first seven days of therapy. After those seven days, the recommended dose is 5 mg taken orally twice a day. For the reduction in the risk of recurrence of DVT and PE, the recommended dose of Eliquis is 2.5 mg taken orally twice a day after at least six months of treatment for DVT or PE. For patients with renal impairment, when looking at the indication of the reduction of risk of stroke and systemic embolism in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation, the recommended dose is 2.5 mg twice a day in patients with at least two of the following characteristics, age greater than or equal to 80 years, body weight less than or equal to 60 kg, um, or serum creatinine greater than or equal to 1.5 mg per deciliter. For patients with end-stage renal disease on dialysis, the clinical efficacy and safety studies with Eliquis did not enroll patients with end-stage renal disease on dialysis. In patients with end-stage renal disease um, on dialysis maintained on intermittent hemodialysis, administration of Eliquis at the usually recommended dose will result in concentrations of apixaban and pharmacodynamic activity that is similar to those observed in the Aristotle study. However, it's not known whether these concentrations will lead to uh, similar stroke reduction and bleeding risk in patients with end-stage renal disease on dialysis, as was seen in the Aristotle study. For patients um, who are, you know, for the indication of prophylaxis of deep vein thrombosis following hip or knee replacement surgery, and for the treatment of DVT, NPE, and reduction in the risk of recurrence of DVT and PE, Again, there is no dosage adjustment that's recommended for those patients with renal impairment, including those with um, end-stage renal disease on dialysis. Clinical efficacy and safety studies with Eliquis did not enroll patients with end-stage renal disease on dialysis or patients with a creatinine clearance that is less than 15 ml a minute. Therefore, dosing recommendations are based on pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data in subjects with end-stage renal disease maintained on dialysis. And when we're talking about pharmacodynamic um, activity there, it's just the anti-10A, anti-factor 10A activity. When converting from or to Eliquis, uh, when looking at warfarin to Eliquis, so switching from warfarin to Eliquis, warfarin should be discontinued and Eliquis started when the INR is below 2. Uh, when switching from Eliquis to Warfarin, uh, generally Eliquis affects the INR, so that initial INR measurement during the transition to Warfarin may not be useful for determining the appropriate dose of Warfarin. So one approach is to discontinue the Eliquis and begin both a parenteral anticoagulant and Warfarin at the time the next dose of Eliquis would have been taken. Discontinuing the parenteral anticoagulant when the INR reaches an acceptable range. Some of the more serious um, adverse reactions associated with the use of apixaban include uh, an increased risk of thrombotic events after premature discontinuation of apixaban, bleeding, and spinal or um, epidural hematomas uh, that may occur in patients that are treated with Eliquis who are receiving neuraxial anesthesia or undergoing spinal puncture. Other adverse reactions that were seen with apixaban in less than 1% of the patient population in a particular study included the hypersensitivity reactions, including drug hypersensitivity such as skin rash, uh, anaphylactic reactions, uh, such as allergic edema and syncope being the other adverse reaction there. For drug interactions, apixaban is a substrate of both CYP3A4 and PGP. Inhibitors of CYP3A4 and PGP increase exposure to apixaban and increase the risk of bleeding. Inducers of CYP3A4 and PGP decrease the exposure to apixaban and increase the risk of stroke and other thromboembolic events. Uh, for patients receiving Eliquis 5 mg or 10 mg twice a day, you would want to uh, reduce the dose of Eliquis by 50% uh, 
when co-administered with drugs that are combined PGP and strong CYP3A4 inhibitors, such as ketoconazole, itraconazole, or ritonavir. Now, for patients receiving Eliquis at a dose of 2.5 mg twice a day, you want to avoid co-administration with a combined PGP and strong CYP3A4 inhibitor. For clarithromycin, although clarithromycin is a combined PGP and strong CYP3A4 inhibitor, the pharmacokinetic data suggests that no dose adjustment is necessary uh, when it's administered with Eliquis. For a combined PGP and strong CYP3A4 inducers, again, that decreases the exposure, you want to avoid the concomitant use of Eliquis with combined PGP and strong CYP3A4 inducers, such as rifampin, carbamazepine, phenytoin, St. John's wort, because such drugs will decrease the exposure to apixaban. For patients who are unable to swallow whole tablets, 5 mg and 2.5 mg Eliquis tablets may be crushed and suspended in water, uh, D5W, or apple juice, or mixed with applesauce and then given um, orally right away. Uh, the alternative method here is that you may crush the Eliquis tablets and suspend it in 60 ml of D5W uh, or water and um, give it through the, um, and administer it through a nasogastric tube. Crushed Eliquis tablets are stable in water, D5W, apple juice, and applesauce for up to four hours. Eliquis is uh, contraindicated in patients with the following conditions, uh, active pathological bleeding, or in patients who have a severe hypersensitivity reaction to Eliquis, for example, an anaphylactic reaction. When looking at the reversal of anticoagulant effect of apixaban, um, there is an agent to reverse the anti-factor 10A activity of apixaban. It is called indexinit alpha, uh, which I will discuss this in uh, later videos. For now, uh, just understand that the pharmacodynamic effect of apixaban can be expected to persist for at least 24 hours after the last dose. So that's about two drug half-lives. Prothrombin complex concentrate, activated prothrombin complex concentrate, or recombinant factor 7A may be considered, but they have not been evaluated in clinical studies. When PCCs are used, monitoring for the anticoagulation effect of apixaban using a clotting test such as PT, INR, or APTT, um, or anti-factor 10A activity is not useful and it's not recommended. Activated oral uh, charcoal reduces absorption of apixaban, so thereby lowering the apixaban plasma concentrations. For hemodialysis, it does not appear to have a substantial impact on apixaban exposure. Protamine sulfate and vitamin K are not expected to affect the anticoagulant effect activity of apixaban. There is no experience with the um, antifibrinolytic agents such as transexemic acid and aminocaproic acid in, in, in individuals receiving apixaban. There is no experience with systemic hemostatics, um, static agents such as desmopressin um, in individuals receiving apixaban. And they're really not expected to be effective as a reversal agent. Thanks for watching and I hope you like, comment and subscribe.